Hi everyone, this is Don Smith. For those of you new to me, I am, am a Sony Artisan of Imagery Pro member. I am also a Singray ambassador. I've been a professional photographer for 42 years, um, all of my adult life. And um, I started out as a sports photographer, worked uh, six, seven years with Sports Illustrated, 28 years with the San Jose Sharks National Hockey League. But all along, I um, really kind of cut my teeth on landscape uh, going back to my high school years. And uh, in the last 13 years, I've been teaching um, landscape photo workshops. Um, and uh, it's what I plan to do for the remainder of my career. I just really love shooting landscape and just sharing a lifetime of knowledge. So if this is your first time um, checking me out, welcome. And for those of you who have been along for a while, I know uh, a lot of that's kind of old hat, but uh, um, I've been around for a while. So <laughs> today um, I decided I wanted to record a video blog on the difference between processing and stylizing an image, because I really think these are two distinctly different ways of thinking about um, working through an image. And I was recently asked a question on my Facebook page by a longtime photo workshop member, Leslie Hagens, who uh, wanted to know if I could go back and actually show this image. And I, I'm going to show the, this is the raw capture of this image. And let me, let me give you the background of the image and then I'll give you Leslie's question and it'll all tie together here. I captured this last Friday evening about, oh, 15 minute drive uh, east of my home in Central California. I live in the Monterey Bay area. I can be out in these rolling hills with, these are blue oak trees. In fact, uh, check out this oak tree on the right. I, I just think that's such a cool looking oak. And uh, I have to thank my uh, uh, friend, Rene Rodriguez, for giving me the information about these. He, he joined me along with my other friend and cohort, cohort um, Mike Hall. So it was just the three of us kind of having a fun time. Um, I like to get out when full moon rises are occurring right around sunset. The image I actually wanted to capture didn't turn out. That was very early in the shoot. This was one of actually the last images in the shoot that I captured. Um, and this was well past uh, sunset into the blue hour, as you can see. And the wind really died down. We uh, noticed that the moon, obviously, as it rose, it's going to move to the right here in the northern hemisphere. And it was going to position itself over these cool looking oak trees. So uh, the image kind of came together. We, we got in our cars, drove from our original location. Uh, I spotted these thistles and this old barbed wire fence and these oaks. And it was kind of like game on from that point. I, this is when I really kind of get absorbed in, into my landscape uh, photography. But this image is going to have to go through two steps. It's going to have to be processed. And, and I'm going to talk about that in, an, in a moment. And then it's going to be stylized. Um, because if we just show the, the raw photo like this, it's kind of blah, right? And before I get again to Leslie's question, let me preface that I did use um, two different filters on this uh, capture. I was shooting with my Sony A7R III, which is my standard landscape camera. It's phenomenal, has an incredible dynamic range. Uh, but having said that, this guy was still lit by the sun and the moon was still lit by the sun. And I kind of have a rule of thumb if I'm shooting moons that if, if the moon is anything over a half moon, um, I want to retain detail up there in the moon and I don't want to blow it out. And as, and as good as the A7R III is, it was just such a disparity in, uh, in um, light tonal values. If I was to have exposed for the moon, this was just going almost really just to blacks. So it, the, the image called for two filters. Number one, it called for a neutral polarizer. That is the type of polarizer I use all the time. Um, my workshop students ask me if I ever take it off any of my lenses, and I don't, other than if I'm shooting right back at the sun, and I can't even tell you 100% of the time I do it then, 
um, or specifically at night. But I have a dedicated uh, 24 millimeter f1.8 Sony lens that I just picked up, and I I don't put any uh, currently don't put any filter onto that lens. Um, I am testing a new night filter, but um, as of right now, I don't apply any filter to that lens. So why a polarizer in this case? Well, anytime I'm faced with foliage in a scene, foliage has a waxy sheen. Um, anything you shoot in nature is going to have a waxy sheen. So I want to turn the polarizer to see if I can just bring out or cut any of that waxy sheen and saturate my colors. So that's really the simple answer. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, especially in a, in a case like this where the light was already getting dark. The second filter I use, and this was to hold back the sky and especially the moon, was a two-step uh, soft grad um, from Singray. And these are all Singray filters I'm using. I've been with Singray my entire career. And as I said, I am a Singray ambassador. Absolutely love their products. Still use them. They make tremendous filters. And if you go to my website, um, there is a discount affiliate where you can get 10% off of any Singray filter. Okay, so that's the processing. Now, let's, or excuse me, that's the, that's the capture end of this. That's why I had to use a two-stop grad. That's why I opted to use a polarizer. Let's get to Leslie's question. And he simply asked, Don, could you come back and show me an image you shot that evening similar to this uh, without any filters and just process in Lightroom? And my answer to him was no, because um, I don't pick a filter just to have a filter on there. There has to be a reason. The polarizer was on there, as I explained to cut the shine off of the foliage. The two-stop grad was on there simply because I needed, I did not want that moon to be blown out. And I like to try to make my pictures as close to capture as I can um, right out of the camera. So here was, this is the raw picture, okay? Pretty well balanced, but you know, it's obviously gonna need some processing. And I'm gonna click along here and here was my finished image where I put in some stylization. So how did I get from this to this, okay? And that's what this video is going to be about. So first thing I wanna do is I wanna bring in this histogram and I want you to look up here. First, I want you to look up here. I'm gonna hover over these numbers. The key number I want you to see up here is that I shot this image at 3200 ISO. And the reason being, if we track along, is I needed the F16 for the depth of field because I was using a 24105 Sony. And uh, to frame this the way I wanted to, it was about 53 millimeters. So, um, you know, I was trying to use the hyperfocal point, which was probably right back up in here but I was bracketing um, where I was placing that point and shooting. And that gave me one fifth of a second, which there was a little bit of a breeze blowing, but I would just try to time the lulls. And I find that after the sun goes down, it, the, um, any, any type of foliage like flowers, or these are just little thistles that are in the landscape, uh, the thermals, um, the, the, the heat rising off the earth tends to cool. So that's what's creating a lot of this bouncing around of this. And as the sun goes down, the ground naturally cools. It was a cool night out there. And um, these things started to steady out. So um, this is why I'm not so quick to leave right after um, uh, sunset. Uh, I think some of the best shooting comes during that dusk hour and conversely on the other end of the day at dawn. So I'm going to come up here because I shot this at 3200. I have a little rule that anything I do ISO wise that's 800 or higher, even though nowadays is really pretty clean, I still transfer it over here to DxO Photo Lab 2. I've been using this program. This is a full blown raw processing program, but I really just use it for their prime noise reduction. And what I do is you come over to noise reduction, you're going to have what they call a fast or a prime. The prime will work with the, the raw 
file, but remember this is a raw file. So when you click export to application, which I have chosen Adobe Lightroom, it, it has to export as something, a JPEG, a TIFF, a PSD, something. So I choose 16-bit TIFF and um, the rest of this you can leave as is. It's not really gonna matter one way or the other. And I'm gonna click export and you're gonna see uh, it's going to, okay, because I've done this already, it's going to want me to use a unique name. And um, now down here, you're going to see the little taskbar come along. And as it's processing, this has really gotten quick over the years. When I first started using this, it could be four or five minutes. Now we're literally talking probably less than a half a second or <laughs> half a minute, not a half a second. It's not that quick. Um, you know, and this is a big file. This is a 42 meg file, 16 bit. There's a lot of data. It's got a crunch. So why do I use DxO Optics? Well, I've been testing noise reduction programs uh, my entire career. This one really has an algorithm, and I can say this honestly over the years, and here you can see it now starting to come into um, Lightroom. I'm going to scroll down here, and there it is. I'm going to double click on that so it comes up. I don't want to import it. I would at this point, but um, I've already done this. So um, for the sake of moving this along, well, we'll go ahead and import it again. What the heck? OK, why do I use DxO Optics? I was saying it will reduce, uh, and this is unequivocally, I can say this through test, two to two and a half stops of noise, possibly even three, with zero. And I mean this zero degradation to the image. Um, and for those of you that have worked with various noise reduction programs, you know what I'm talking about. The more you, you start to reduce noise, the softer the image becomes. And you can see there is just no noise up in this blue area of the picture. And that's where you're going to typically tend to see the noise. Um, I can I can scroll this along. And you can see I, I, got, I did a really, really good job at getting uh, the focus good back in here. It's a little soft focus up in there, um, but that's okay. You know, um, we, we can live with that. And uh, I did, just so you know, shot another frame where I focused back in here and I did do a focus stack. I'm not keen on focus stacking too much. I think the key for me is if I can get the foreground in good sharp focus, and this is a little soft, um, it's going to look, tend to look a more, little more natural to the eye. But I did have the picture where I could have done it either way. Okay, now, before we get into what I call the processing end, it is always key to have a histogram up. I think it's key when I'm shooting to have a histogram up, and it's key when I'm processing to have a histogram up. And if you don't know anything about a histogram, just know that the right side, this is broken up, um, into 256 tones of black and white from all the way to the left, which would be 000 in your red, green, and blue channel, all the way over to 255, uh, red, green, and blue. So if you add zero as a number, it uh, comes up to 256 tones of black and white. And really right in here is where all the heavy lifting is done for me. I always start on the whites and you can see I've blown just a smidgen of the moon there. So what I'm gonna do is come to highlights and just back that little red part off until it goes away. Now the blacks, I wanna have a little bit of blacks. This is called D-Max, so you have a little bit. Um, when you when you go to print, uh, you do want, it's, it's your, the printer needs to see some absolute blacks. And the reason I sent the whites is the printer needs to know what is going to be the whitest tone in this scene that we want to print. And that's why I got the whites under control, but I let a little bit of the blacks um, out of control, if that makes sense. I hope that does make sense. And then the rest is just massaging your midtones in here. I mean, I could come in here and open up the shadows a little. I can bump a little contrast. Um, and you know, we're pretty close almost to a finished image anyway. Right there could be very acceptable. But now I want to get a little bit more and I want to see what we can do with this image. I love third party software. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up a copy of this in Lightroom. And that means it's going to retain those little settings that I have made. 
Uh, and I said Lightroom, I meant Photoshop. And here it is in Photoshop. Let me just expand the program here. Okay, so that's my processed image. Um, some of you at this point could be very much done with this image. I don't think I am. I think there's more in here to be had. And uh, I want to bring out a little bit more into this image. So um, if you've been following along over the last couple of years, you know I am really keen on two third-party programs, one being On One Software and one being Luminar. And I also love the stuff from Topaz, don't get me wrong. This is the cool thing. All these third-party uh, programs, I think, are pushing along Adobe to, to give us a little bit more and, and keep ahead of the game. You know, I tell a lot of students, you, if, if you can pick any one of these one softwares and lock in. As a workshop instructor, I don't have that freedom because I don't know where my students' backgrounds are. Some of them might be using On One, some of them might be using Luminar, Topaz, uh, Lightroom, Photoshop Elements, Photoshop with Bridge. I mean, I, I gotta be, Capture One is another one, I've gotta be kind of well-versed across the spectrum um, to help these people out. Aperture was another one that Apple made. Uh, and finally did away with. Okay, so one of the cool things down here with Luminar, and I've done videos on this, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, is they have these presets, and a lot of times I will come into some of these and just, you know, click on them and see what what's what. Um, I'm not really finding anything that I'm liking too much down in here. Warm, warm sunset looks pretty cool, but I think it's kind of over dramatic dramatizing the sky. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna come in to Luminar's landscape filters. And I think this, this is where I start out a lot if I can't find something in one of the presets. And um, you can see this is just replicating what was in Photoshop in their, or in Lightroom or in Adobe Camera Raw. Um, and we've already made the changes there. So I'm gonna come down to two of their artificial intelligence filters. And I really think, honestly, this is where we're heading in software. The algorithms are being written to really kind of get inside a photographer's mind uh, mindset of how we're trying to balance an image. And that's how I look at processing image. We're really trying to, to balance it out tonal and color and draw the eye where we want it to go. So the two key ones here that they currently have are Accent AI, and I'm just gonna tug on that a little bit. And that does a pretty cool job of bringing up the foliage. So, you know, it's on a slider, you just go back and forth. I think maybe that's a little over the top. And I'm gonna try now just seeing what would do with the sky. That's kind of like turning a polarizer, right? I mean, uh, that's a little too much, too over the top, but I'm gonna bring a little bit more out of that. Um, I could use an adjustable gradient on this, but it's already been balanced in my shoot. And that's, again, why when I talked on the front end about using filters, I didn't wanna lose this detail in the moon. So we can skip right over this. Vibrance, do I wanna do anything there? Yuck, no, I don't. I am just gonna hit the X and take that one right out of there. Um, advanced contrast, mm, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip over that. One of them I'm gonna come down to here is the polarizing filter. Uh, excuse me, not the polarizing filter, the uh, foliage enhancer. And this is really just gonna look for any of the greens and kind of enhance them up. I do like that. Now, the one that always kind of amazes me, and I just try it out, and this is in Lightroom, it's getting into a lot of programs, is Dehaze. And let's just kind of pull this one along and see what it does. And look at a little bit, I want you to keep the eye on the moon up there, what it's doing to it. It's cutting the haze of the cloud and revealing kind of the warmth of the moon to come through. So there it's without, and there it is with, and remember, at any time, I can come here and I can brush in and out an effect. I can just brush it into a certain part of the picture. So that's kind of like masking. I can add a, a, a radial mask, a gradient mask. 
I can do a lot of stuff. So again, I am in the section now where I'm just stylizing this. I'm just trying to get a little bit more pop out of this image. Golden hour, let's see what that will do with it. It's gonna to try to warm the whole scene up. I think the scene is still a little too blue. And um, we'll just keep going along here. Uh, structure, this is kind of like the new texture command that was just put into Lightroom. But uh, I think everything in here is so sharp. I don't wanna do radiance, that's gonna give it a softer, more mystic feel. And I'm really not uh, wanting to put a big vignette around it because it's going to vignette these corners up here. So um, I think at this point, I'm going to click Apply. And as I said, I think it's, a, it's, it's way too blue, but I'm going to show you my method of getting the blues out. Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. I'm going to bring this back into Photoshop. And this is why I do open it in and out of Photoshop. This is how I... I do my workflow. You can do it any way you want. This is a standalone program. You can bring it back into Lightroom, etc. cetera. Uh, but let me, uh, let me get the, the uh, zoom tool here. You can see there's, it's so blue, it's putting blue fringing around the trees here, and that's not natural. So here's the way I like dealing with it. I am going to come over here uh, to my layers palette, and I'm gonna come up to hue saturation. And they, Adobe has this little targeted adjustment tool right there, which is awesome. When you move it in here, it's an eyedropper. So when you click, you don't have to think about what color you're clicking on. Adobe will just pick it for you. And if I've moved to the right, I would amp those blues. Well, that's not what I want to do. I want to take that blue out a little bit. I don't want to reduce it all the way. I just want to tone it down just a smidgen. And I'm only taking this down about a negative nine. Okay, somewhere in there. All right. And uh, I think things are looking a lot better just, just with that one click. It's just looking a little more neutral in there. Um, you know, I can come in here now and maybe try another hue saturation layer and see if we can find anything warm. I'm going to come over here into these warmer grasses right on the edge here. Now it's picking up blue, blue, uh, cyan. So what this is telling me is this is, has a color cast, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and flatten these. Command, Control, E, or you can come up to Layer, Flatten, Layers. And I'm going to open up Adobe Camera Raw. You can come up through the filter menu and do that. And I'm just going to have to take some blue out of there this way by uh, taking my color temperature and just warming it up. And now I'm getting the overall look that I, I want in this picture. I don't think I have to mess with the tint, but that was going to be the only way I was going to get that blue out of there and warm this up a little more natural looking. Okay, I think there's one more thing I want to do on the stylization of this image. And it doesn't involve a vignette, as I said. Uh, I, I like to kind of darken things down on my own. So I'm taking this lasso tool um, and let me just kind of draw around in this area. I'm gonna just do what I call a very loose selection. And I'm gonna stick the cursor inside the selection and right click to feather. And I want this to be a nice smooth transition. So I'm gonna go 300 pixels on this. And I'm gonna come up and grab in my layers palette a curve adjustment. Take your targeted adjustment tool come right inside where that marching ants, the marching ants are still active. Um, they've just been hidden because I put an adjustment layer on there. And I'm gonna darken that down, just pull that down a little bit to force the eye back up into the scene. So um, I'm really almost there. I'm gonna flatten this layer. I'm gonna add one more. I just wanna try something here. This may work, this may not. I'm gonna go into color balance and I'm just gonna take the reds a little bit, a little bit more reddish. Uh, I don't wanna go too much because it's, um, yeah, well, no, you know what? That's not gonna work because it, to me, it's turning the sky too purple. So I've gotten this, really, this image about to where I want it to be. And that's, um, that was really the goal of this video anywhere, was just to 
show you the difference between stylizing an image and uh, processing an image. So the next time somebody comes up to you and says, hey, did, was that picture photoshopped? <laughs> You know, I laugh at that. That's kind of like back in the black and white days when I was shooting neg film and somebody comes up to me, hey, did you, uh, did you print that image? I mean, you have to work on a raw file. I think all of you serious photographers out there know that. These are the people on social media that, that may not know that, you know. Um, and yes, you do have to work on this image. I want to show you one other real cool trick and then we're going to wrap this up. Um, up here in Photoshop, they have a selection tool. I want to see if I can kind of, because of the grad, I sort of cut, you can see these trees are darker than it's revealing the foliage in um, this part of the scene where the grad wasn't over it. So let me come up here under select and I'm going to come here. You have two ways of doing this, color range, focus area. I'm going to come to color range. We're going to try to build a mask just on these trees right here. So I'm just going to click in on that tree and then I'm going to move this fuzziness slider until I look into this box and I can see that most of the trees are selected. Okay, the what's white is going to be selected, what black is not going to be. And I'm going to click OK. And that put the mask on this color balance layer. But what I want to do is I want to do a curves layer. Okay, so it comes up empty mask. Do I have to go through that procedure again? No, I can copy and paste this mask. And it's real simple on a, a Mac or a PC. Just hit the con, uh, command or option key, uh, uh, alt or option, excuse me. Click on this mask, which I created, drag it up. And now I have that mask attached to my curves layer. And now I'm just going to come into one of these trees and I'm going to lift up a little bit. And you can see it's starting to reveal the tree. Look at how much I bent this, this command or this curve line back here. And if you don't know anything about curves, it's basically your level tool turned on a diagonal. So down here on the bottom left is blacks. Up here on the top right is whites. And there's my control point there. If I come up about a quarter box, you can see this is broken up into quarters. I can steepen that, and every time I steepen a curve, I'm adding contrast to it. So now, let's turn this off, turn it on. You can see it's subtle, but it did bring out uh, a little bit of those trees. Let's come back and add um, one more color balance. I'm going to option all click, and so I can take the mask there. And I'm just going to um, take the green up just a little bit in those trees. And there we go. Now I'm getting those oak trees to kind of come out. Do you see that? Because that's all controlled by the mask. So it's not affecting my blue sky up here. It's not affecting the grasses down in here. And um, it's not affecting anything down in here very much. Um, so there you go. You know, I can flatten that down and now do my final little tweaks with it. Um, I always will go back and I'm going to open this back up into Adobe Camera Raw, which is your Lightroom develop module. And I always come back and recheck my highlights and blacks because anytime I'm making changes, you can see I opened up that moon. So we're just going to pull it back with the highlight slider. Uh, we kind of diminished our black, so we're going to bring a few in. And, you know, we're about ready to call this a finished print um, or a finished picture, you know. So there you go. I, I hope you've learned the difference with this video between what I term processing and what I term stylizing. I do go through this procedure with every image that I work on. Some I can get it all in one shot in Lightroom. Some takes a little bit more pushing along. I just love what these third party filters can do, especially the artificial intelligence. And by the way, I meant to mention back at the start of the video that Topaz also has just come out with a new artificial intelligence noise reduction filter. Pretty cool. You ought to go download that and check it out. And you can get to any of this, any of this software via my website, which is listed here below donsmithphotography.com and just click on the discount and affiliates link and um, 
it just will step you right through to getting to where you need to go real quick and getting the discounts. I do not have a discount on DXO, Mark. Um, I've contacted them. They don't seem to have an affiliate program, but um, the rest of them, I think you're, uh, you're, you're good to go. All right, so that wraps up today's video. Leslie, I hope I've answered your question more in detail on why I use the filters on the front end. And um, I hope I explained to the rest of you not only that, but why I go through processing an image and what I consider processing and then stylizing an image and, and finishing it off. So um, until next time, uh, this is Don Smith. You take care.